Uh, welcome. So we're happy to have you here. My name is Wally Fu, a member of the Science, Medicine, and the Technology Curriculum Committee. And our team is happy to bring you today's program by Lou Morrell. Uh, please take out your cell phone, which I'm going to do right now, and ensure that you silence your phone. So I'm going to do the same thing here to make sure it goes on to, yeah, silence your phone at least for the next hour and a half. Uh, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I'd like to welcome the crowd to join via Zoom. Uh, in a has virtual classroom, especially thank to Dave McGinn in the back here uh, for supporting our hybrid mode. If you have questions or comments to post at the appropriate time, we like to have you wait till the microphone is near you so you can answer, ask the questions. Otherwise we will have to have the speaker to repeat the question. Uh, we look forward to Welcome you to next Monday's program. The monthly program is titled Music Unites Us, hosted on Tuesday on December 5th at 9.30 a.m. at the Jack Miller Center of the Arts. The program is a collaboration with the Holland Symphony Orchestra. Orchestra is a very good orchestra and will feature live performance of traditional African music. Coffee, cookies, and conversation begins at nine o'clock. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Lou. Lou is also a member of HASP and he retired from a food company down in Battle Creek and his degree, <laughs> yes. There were three. There, there was three, <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. So uh, it, he has, he received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from McGill University, one of the best universities in Canada. In fact, Mario uh, Haladin in the chemistry department at Hope is a McGill graduate, which is a very good friend of mine. And Lou, after receiving his bachelor's degree, and he went to Michigan State, another very fine school, and he got his degree in food science, then he worked in the food industry for about 30 years. And he has played a significant role in the introduction of, uh, thank you, thank an introduction of iron into uh, cereal. So this fortification of iron in cereal, he has something to do with this. So this is uh, his background and I'd like to welcome Lou to talk about women in science. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the first of two installations on women scientists. And we'll be examining many of the challenges and barriers and obstacles that many of them had to face, but also some of their remarkable contributions. I'd like to start with a short video clip and it will illustrate to a large degree what we'll be talking about. Um, it's, um, I'll set it up for you. Some of you will be familiar with it. It takes place first in a cafeteria in a workplace. A man and a woman, both chemists, are sitting at a table having lunch and discussing some scientific information. Her manager comes to the table and barks out an order for her to take care of after lunch. The couple leave the work, the cafeteria, go into the hallway, and there, especially there, I want you to pay attention to a couple of parts of the dialogue. There will be an explanation on her part of how she feels about her status at work, and then she will ask her male colleague a very probing question. So let's take a look at that. It is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, but if you consider Occam's razor, would nature choose a system that is more complex to create something less complex? Mm. So RNA world theory. Besot! I'm gonna be needing one of your special cups of joe to get me through this afternoon. Right? Of course, I would be much further along in my research if I wasn't making excellent coffee for mediocre chemists. 
You're on the verge of a major scientific breakthrough. You need to talk to Donati. I did. He said no. That doesn't make any sense. Why? Sex discrimination. What? Well, also politics and favoritism in general and fairness, but yes, mostly sex discrimination. I don't understand. Why would anyone discriminate based on something as intellectually non-determinative as gender? Calvin. How many female scientists can you name? Madame Curie? Exactly. Do you think that's just by happenstance? I don't know. I hadn't considered it until now. Of course, you haven't had to. Because people fully appreciate your potential. This is me. Raise your hand if you'd like coffee. Some of you recognize that scene. If you read the book Lessons in Chemistry, which was published and released last year by Barney Garmus. And you may have seen this. Uh, it's playing now on, I believe, Apple TV, a series based on the book. So two things happen in the hallway. She expresses the fact that she believes that she's not appreciated and she's a skilled chemist. So her name is Elizabeth. His name is Calvin. Calvin is going to be nominated for the Nobel Prize. And he believes in her. He believes that she belongs at the research institute where they work. But you heard her boss. He asked her to go get coffee. And then at the end of the scene, she asks the people in the room who wants coffee. This was set in the early 1960s in California. And Elizabeth goes on. She becomes an unwed mother. She changes her career. She becomes a television cooking show host with a lot of success. And she's a little bit revolutionary because she throws chemistry into her, her, her programming. And she refers to adding tablespoons of acetic acid instead of vinegar. And she also adds a pinch of sodium chloride. So she definitely is different. And this is indicative of what we're going to examine today and next week. Some of these challenges, some of the preconceived notions, and some of the barriers that many women, even successful women, have encountered. Now, let's think about this question that she asked. How many female scientists do you know? Some of you, probably because you've been either interested in the topic or because you're a scientist yourself, you may have a long list of names to share. But think about the mere mortals out there who don't know so much about science. Do you believe that they would come up with many names other than Madame Curie? She's an icon, an inspiration, as we'll discover later on. But I suspect that the average person on the street would not be able to think about many names of women scientists. And yet, as we'll discover, there were many who made a lot of contributions. So here's the agenda for today. I will attempt to give a succinct uh, description of some of the obstacles, the social barriers, the cultural barriers, that are plaguing women scientists and have done so for a long time, keeping in mind, and I'll show some information later that we've come a long way. Eventually, I'll show you a long lineage of women scientists, some names you'll recognize, some you may have never heard of. And then I'll talk about the lack of recognition of many women who were in the sciences in general, technology, mathematics, engineering, and then we'll delve into a few select remarkable scientists and continue this list next week. So here is a concise image of what a scientist looks like based on some research. It's a man, and the man wears a, a white coat and he works in the lab. He probably wears glasses, he's probably middle-aged, he may be even old, he may be wear a, be a beard, and he is surrounded by all kinds of equipment and test tubes and glassware. And it's, but there may be a mess on every table, every bench in the, in the picture. Um, he writes notes in big black notebooks. He may even carry one in the pocket of his, of his lab coat. And he will often be portrayed as the individual with the disheveled hair, the, the uh, black rimmed glasses shouting, I got it, I got it, 
But because he's a scientist, some people believe that we will get better and improved products, and that's often the case. And some people imagine that he will be reading a book, perfecting his knowledge about a topic. Now, I suspect from your reaction that this is something you might expect, as the image of a scientist, and that image per persists today. David Chambers uh, did a uh, Chambers did a very interesting study some 40 years ago, and he asked over 4,800 children to draw the image of a scientist. Now, this is 40 years ago. And he then did the, he looked at all of these, these drawings. They were for kindergartners all the way to fifth grade. And he tried to draw conclusions from what they drew. Well, this is typical of many of the representations. And what Chambers drew, the, what the conclusion that he drew was that this standard image that I just described a moment ago becomes embedded by the fourth or fifth grade. Only 28 drawings out of the 4,800 showed a woman as a scientist. This is 40 years ago. Today, I'd like to think that we are enlightened and that if Chambers or one of his colleagues were to do this again, it would be somewhat different. So finally, he concluded that science is a one gender world. And as you will find out, if you don't already, many women scientists and engineers found that out the hard way in their own lives. It was true then, and to some extent, still true today, that women are expected to take care of family life, to nurture, to bring up the children, to, to, uh, to establish relationships and provide support. So well, why have women faced all these difficulties to contribute to science and engineering? And you yourselves may have experienced it, or you know people who have, some women who have had a hard time getting to the top in, in their sciences. Well, we know for a fact that women are still underrepresented in all of these STEM careers. And to this day, there are still some academic departments around this country and elsewhere that are resistant to address these barriers. Uh, Sharon Bird, in her book, Removing Barriers, which is now 20 years old, addressed this. And interestingly enough, Almost, well, 15 years later, uh, Katie Zernica wrote a scathing book about what was going on at MIT. And there, too, they had some very serious barriers for women there. And the women, some of them, rebelled. And it's a very interesting book that she calls The Exceptions. So... If we know that girls outperform boys in exams in general, why is it that they, they face such unequal opportunities to, to prove that they can excel in the workplace? Patricia Farah wrote the book, Scientists Anonymous. And she talked about many of these so-called great women of science. And she, she found that very few of them were able to achieve the top levels in the hierarchy in science and engineering, that they could not become directors or, uh, or chancellors of universities. There are exceptions, and I will point that out later. But generally speaking, it was difficult for them to become the deans of a department, for example. And in industry, the same thing, that men were often chosen over women, even though they may have had the same skill set. So she profiles Marie Curie and, and Florence Nightingale and Rosalind Franklin, among others, in her book and gives some examples. And we'll address some of these later on. But she also gives the profiles of some very unknown mathematicians and chemists and some scientists that we're not very familiar with. But she was able to demonstrate that these people were very skilled and yet they were held back. So why is this? Well, for one thing, there's this cultural idea of what one gender should do and the other one should do. 
there has been this idea that um, if you're going to be a professional, you should behave this way. And it has led to an expectation that there has to be what some authors have called a degree of masculinity in what you're doing. And we'll explore that a little bit later as well. So uh, we, we will find out that a lot of women over time and in different locations have had difficult access to higher education. In one way or another, they were barred from participating. They've had a lack of resources, and will, that will become obvious later on as well, where they were refused access to certain institutions. And we can talk about the old boys network, that women are inherently excluded from it. And that has been a barrier as well for women to demonstrate their performance. As for uh, women scientists, as uh, Julie Desjardins in her book promotes, women often attack a problem from a different angle. They may ask different questions. They may use different methods to get the answers to what they're doing, different from what their male counterparts are doing. They're being creative, imaginative. And they may have different explanations for observed phenomena, but not always recognized. And if we go back to the video clip, uh, Liz, Elizabeth certainly felt that she wasn't appreciated, even though she was she believed firmly that she had the right skill set. And as Calvin said, you're on the verge of a discovery. But did her boss care? No. Again, this was 60 years ago. It's set in the early 60s. And we can argue, ah, it's so different today. But is it? Is it? Um, some British researchers named Head, Fitchett, and Cook did a rather exhaustive study. They looked at all the grants that were awarded for a four, during a 14-year period in the United Kingdom, and they focused specifically on grants that were awarded to people who were doing work on infectious diseases, doing research in that area. And they found, and I'm actually simplifying this considerably here, but they found overwhelmingly that men got a, about three quarters of all the grants awarded to them. Now you could argue easily, yeah, but there may have been three quarters of the people requesting grants that were men. True, but let's also think of the distribution of funds. Three quarters of the men who were requesting the money got more money than the women. So out of the 2.3 billion pounds that were awarded during those 14 years of grant awards, men got three quarters of the amount of the money. So what these researchers found is that over the years, there were consistent differences in funding based on the gender of the people requesting the grants. Now we move forward and we look at some census data, the most recent data in the US. And in the US population, women are essentially half of the population in the workforce. About half of them are women. But yet, in the STEM workforce, in mathematics, engineering, in the sciences, they only represent one-third of the workforce. So definitely underrepresented there. And that's interesting, too, because if you look at the enrollment in our colleges and universities today, there are a lot of women. And in fact, in many places, Hope is an example, but it's not, it's, it's not the only place. There are more women enrolled than men in many universities and colleges. So the census tells us that among the life scientists, that's biological sciences and a few others, about half of the people in the workforce are women, but only about a third in physical sciences, which include chemistry and physics and geology and many others. In the computer world, in mathematics, even fewer, only a quarter of the workforce is made up of women. And in engineering, well, one out of six is a woman. And for those of you who are engineers, who know engineers, you may this, know this to be true. And I, for one, experienced that as well. 
uh, interestingly enough, Wally mentioned that I worked at one of those food companies in Battle Creek, and we did hire a lot of engineers. And though we had more men than women, we had a very good share of women engineers, mechanical engineers and chemical engineers, which is very interesting, but it's not representative necessarily. Um, when I was a student, I remember, and this is typical because it's a very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a field on the fringe. I worked with a mining engineer and he told me that in his class, there was one woman. It must have been difficult for her to be integrated into that. If you are familiar with the enrollment at Michigan Tech University, you will find that there are a lot of men there and not so many women, even today. So uh, we know that in the workforce, women are underrepresented, even more so in the engineering fields at present. And now we look at median earnings. And some of you had lengthy careers, perhaps in academia, perhaps in industry, and you may be fully aware of all these differences. But if you go to the third line for biology, you notice that according to the most recent census, the median salary of men and women in that field or that discipline is at parity. But that's the exception. And if you look at computer scientists, I mentioned that uh, only about a quarter of the people in that field are women. They are they lag behind in the median salary by quite a bit. The same thing is true for chemists. Significant difference between salaries for women and men. And electrical engineers, not quite the same gap, but still, there is quite a difference in the salary. And you may ask the question, why is that? So we definitely see that there is a gap based on gender in most STEM disciplines, even to this day in this country. Let me share with you uh, the names of some remarkable women scientists that will bring us up to the present. And some of these names you have never heard of. Um, I'm thinking here specifically of a woman who lived in Babylon some 2,000, actually about 4,500 years ago. And there is a record of her. She was a priestess, and she was also well-versed in mathematics at the time and astronomy. And that is surprising, perhaps, but she contributed quite a bit to the ba Babylonian culture at the time because of her knowledge and skill. Now we go to the first century A.D., and we go to Egypt, which also had quite a lot of mathematicians and astronomers, but this woman, named, known as Maria the Jewess, was a chemist, or perhaps the first alchemist, if we want to go there. And she designed and built what we might call chemical instruments. She designed the water bath, the double boiler, and she used it to make good use of it. And interestingly enough, the French word for water bath is bain marie, as in Maria. That name has persisted for 2,000 years. So bain marie is the French word for double boiler, a water bath. She also synthesized a lead, copper, sulfide pigment. Pigments were very important in Egypt uh, for um, dyeing clothing, for adornment of the skin. They used the equivalent of cosmetics, usually using natural pigments. And to this day, that particular compound is still referred to as Marie's Black. So her name has persisted through the ages. In uh, a couple of centuries later, we learned that Hypatia was a mathematician and an astronomer who was also well-versed for her time in physics and in chemistry and in medicine. And we're going to see a little bit more about that, how women were involved in medical affairs throughout the ages. Now we, we go to the Middle Ages, and there's about a thousand years there that span history where science did not really prosper. There were some exceptions, of course. And one of them is that European universities started to pop up the 11th century. 12th century, 13th century, then there was 
quite um, a, a resurgence of interest in higher education, and there were more people who were going to go to these universities, and they popped up all over what is now Europe and Germany and Italy, Spain, and in Italy especially, they had a long history there of higher education, but only the universities in Bologna and Salerno actually admitted women. No other university, and there had been a few in England and in Germany and in France that had, pre that had preceded those, they didn't accept women, only men. But Bologna and Salerno did. In fact, Salerno had a medical college where they admitted women. And Salerno existed from that time, the 13th century, until I believe it was 1817. And the king of Naples put an end to it by decree. He just shut down the university. It was part of the post-Napoleonic plan. And Salerno didn't exist anymore, but it did survive for about 500 years, and it was a very reputed university. Throughout the years, this time period, women are essentially excluded from higher education, and they're excluded from the medical profession, with very few exceptions. So that was certainly a challenge for a lot of women. We continue now with some other women that you may be familiar with. The English woman, Margaret Cavendish, who, whose life spanned much of the 17th century. She studied astronomy, mathematics, she wrote books about it, and other topics in science as well. A well-regarded scientist, but I don't think that her name would come up if you were to ask a person, can you name female scientists? Even though she's more contemporary than many others, Marie Curie would still be the number one choice. In the 18th century, a woman named Maria Agnesi made her mark as well. She was a Spaniard, and interestingly enough, very good at mathematics. She studied calculus, and being an exception, she held a chair at the University of Bologna in Italy, not in Spain, in Italy. I mentioned a moment ago that Bologna was one of the few institutions that not only admitted women, but now had women teaching at the university. That was a rarity, and it was going to be a rarity for a long time, as you'll discover. You may be familiar with the British astronomer William Herschel, but are you familiar with Caroline? That was his sister, and William gets a lot of accolades for his work, but in fact, she, uh, Caroline, and her brother William worked together, and together they discovered a lot of comets and I don't think that her name comes up very often either. William does, but not so much Caroline, his sister. By the same token, we now move to Austria, and there's a woman named Maria de Blau. She passed away in 1970, so she was a contemporary to many other scientists that you will be familiar with. She worked in, in particle physics, and physics really got... Um, a boost in the 20th century for a variety of reasons, particle physics included. And if you think about the, um, the model of the atom that Niels Bohr proposed, and then you go to the atomic bomb, and you go to nuclear reactors for power, nuclear physics have been a part of the 20th century, and yet Marietta, Marietta Blau's contributions remain rather obscure. So I mentioned earlier that there are these inequalities between genders and the sciences, and I, I preface this by saying that I'm going to give some potential reasons for it, but there's a lot of disagreement in the social sciences about whether any of these are correct. But we have to ask ourselves, are women inherently poorer than men at doing mathematics? Well, I, from my personal experience, can refute that wholeheartedly. I have lots of personal experience with it. Um, there was a friend of the family. She grew up with my mother, and she was a very bright woman. And more than 60 years ago, she was the only person, only woman, in a department at Bell Canada, Bell Telephone. 
and she was very good at mathematics. And there was an, a course given inside Bell for their employees. She was the only woman in the course, and she finished on top. And I know many others, contemporaries, not 60 years ago, but contemporaries today, women who are inherently good at mathematics. But that question did come up often in the past. Are women inherently poorer than men at math? I take you back to the video clip. Um, Elizabeth wholeheartedly believed that there was sex discrimination going on in her workplace. Uh, as you'll find out, she was not unique. We're going to encounter other examples where the women who worked in, in that field, in whatever field it was in the sciences, felt that they were excluded from the network of people around them, and they were not recognized for what they could do. That British study of granting awards tells us that there may be preferential allocation of funds to efforts that are led by men. I like to think that that has changed and that it is no longer the case that there is this difference in allocating funds. What if, what if all the requests that came to those who hold the purse strings and make the decisions came anonymously and they didn't know whether it was a man or a woman who was the lead researcher requesting the funds? Would that make a difference? Are there preconceived notions? Hmm. Now, studies have shown that over the years, many women who have degrees in science, for one reason or another, and there are many reasons, but for one reason or another, instead of doing research and infiltrating themselves into the environment I've described, they choose not to do that. And instead of committing to research, they prefer to teach. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't gender discrimination in the educational field as well, but they prefer to do that as opposed to doing research. So I think we can conclude, no matter what the reasons are, that there are still gender inequalities in the STEM workforce and that they are present with us for some time, I suspect. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. <clears throat> So let, let me point out a few examples where there have been some women who have worked in the background and have contributed tremendously. And this one will be familiar to most, if not all of you, thanks to Margot Lee Shetterly, whose father worked at NASA, and she grew up knowing about these women these so-called human computers that NASA use. And if you've read the book or seen the movie Hidden Figures, you're familiar with the situation where these women were in the background, but women like Dorothy Vaughn and Christine Darden, Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and many others were the ones who did the calculations and reviewed calculations. And if you recall the book or the movie, John Glenn had decided that he would have faith in their calculations. And there's a famous scene in the movie where he asks if the computers have verified the numbers for the flight path. And when he's told, yes, it's a go for him. He has that much faith in them. But if it hadn't been for Margot Lee Shetterly, we still wouldn't know about their contributions. And it's an interesting fact that that continued into the 60s. And uh, it's very much like going from the abacus to the slide rule to the handheld calculator, the, the women, the computers did that too. So now there are more and more women who are involved, having had a very modest beginning in the background, sheltered from public um, recognition. But I believe that now uh, the, the situation has changed considerably, not just because of the book or the movie, but I believe that recognition is much greater than it was. But these women were not the only ones who didn't get recognition. Everyone here is familiar with the Manhattan Project. And you can easily name some people who participated, who were the principal actors in the Manhattan Project. Now, Robert Oppenheimer comes to mind, Enrico Fermi, and uh, several others. But do you know this woman? 
Her name is Qian Xiong Wu. On the left is an American postage stamp. How many of you have actually seen this stamp, which was issued in January of 2021? And admittedly, you don't get much mail coming to your mailbox these days that has a stamp on it. And my grievance with the United States Postal Service is that the designer of this stamp doesn't inform us very much about her life. It says her name and it says nuclear physicist. Okay, so what did she do? Well, in fact, she did a lot. And she had quite an interesting life. She was born in China. She came to the U.S. to study in the middle of the 1930s, and she stayed. And she made a name for herself in her field, and she was involved in the Manhattan Project. But her name does not come up. It never comes up, nor does the name of hundreds of other scientists physicists, engineers, chemists, who were involved not only at Los Alamos, but also at Oak Ridge and the University of Chicago. But their names never come up in the conversation, nor does Qian Sheng Wu's. So um, uh, if you are interested in this topic here, Ruth Howes wrote a book about all, well, not all, but many of these women scientists who contributed to the Manhattan Project, and we just have never heard of. But she's not the only one. The woman here is Henrietta Levitt, not a household name. However, she worked in the 1880s and beyond at the Harvard Observatory. Of course, it was directed by men. The astronomers were male. And they too, like NASA, half a century later, had human number crunchers. So what they did, they would set up the telescopes, they would take photographs at night of the sky on glass plates. And when they were developed, these human number crunchers would analyze the position of the stars and planets on the photographic plates. And they would make observations. They would make calculations. Some of these women did this probably as a matter of routine. They did what they were taught to do. But among them, there were several women who were astronomers in their own right, who understood the laws of physics and wanted to know more. And Levitt was one of them. So she came up with the law based on her observations and calculations that allowed astronomers to use, to, to detect stars that had rhythmic brightness. And that was indicative of changes in the cosmic rays that were coming to us. And it was the start of something big. But still to this day, we don't know much about Henrietta Levitt, do we? She wasn't the only one. There were 216 women who studied these glass plates over time. And they got no recognition for their work. And this is very well chronicled in a paper titled Women in Glass that was published in the Journal for the History of Astronomy by a woman named Lindsay Zrall. At the time, her name was Lindsay Smith. And she worked at the Harvard Observatory some 20 years ago and beyond until, until, until recently. And she wrote this paper that chronicled the history of what these women did and some of their accomplishments. And if you'd like to speak with her, Lindy, Lindsay's role is a librarian at Herrick Library here in Holland now. I met her earlier this year. Uh, I went to a lecture uh, that was given by Peter Berkey on women who had contributed to astronomy over time. And she was there, of course. She was the, the, the coordinator of sorts for that event. And that's how I learned about her involvement at the Harvard Observatory and this paper that she wrote. That's a fascinating account of what these women did. Again, this is Annie Cannon here that is pictured here. Not a household name. And yet, like Henrietta Levitt, she also contributed tremendously to the efforts of the astronomers who did work 
in the 1880s to the 1900s at the Harvard Observatory. So I think we can conclude thinking of the NASA number crunchers and thinking of Qian Xiong Wu and these women at the Harvard Observatory that there has been a significant lack of recognition of women in the sciences and in engineering. And that brings us to our, our first selected scientist. I suspect that not many of you are familiar with Emilie du Châtelet, a French woman from the 18th century, but she definitely had a tremendous impact because of her contributions to the so-called Enlightenment period that followed her. So in the early years, her name was Émilie Le Tonnelier. She was born at the beginning of the 18th century. That puts things in context as to, in France, as to what was known at the beginning of the 18th century. Her father had a fabulous job. He had two roles in the court of the Sun King, Louis XIV. He was the official reader for the king. He delivered the news, as it were. And he was also the master of protocol for the ambassadors from other principalities and neighboring kingdoms that came to the court of Louis XIV. So he had interactions with those people who were part of the elite. And because he was a member of the court, he was surrounded by some very high-powered, influential people, both in politics, but also in the sciences at the time. So because of this, Emilie, the young Emilie, got a superior education because her father was in contact with all these people and knew more than the common person in the kingdom. So she has this education, she learns languages, and she gets to know more about the natural sciences. Well, she married the Marquis du Châtelet at age 19, which was not uncommon, I'm sure, in those days. She had two sons with him, and her position in life, with all its accoutrements, bored her. And after the children were of a certain age, she went back to what she did best, what she really enjoyed, poring over mathematical texts. And that is not something that a lot of women did at the beginning of the 18th century. But Emilie certainly enjoyed that, and she was good at it, very good at it. At the beginning of the 18th century, it was still believed that fire, water, air, and earth were the elements, that they were the basis of everything we could look at, we could see around us. There were a few incursions. So I believe they were German, and they had determined that mercury and sulfur were also elements. So all of a sudden, it's creeping into what we know today. But it wasn't an idea that was embraced by everyone yet. And keep in mind, it took time to disseminate ideas at the beginning of the 18th century. So the French Academy of Sciences had a competition. They invited people to write essays on fire, it being an element. And Emilie was intrigued by this, and she decided that she would write about the propagation of fire, the nature and propagation of fire. And in her lifetime, she did conduct experiments with fire. Those were not her best. She could not draw some conclusions. But what is important is that she was an experimenter. And she was very good at setting up experiments, making observations, detailed observations, and computing results, analyzing them, and determining if they were valid or not. She was definitely ahead of her time. At the time, there were two schools of thought that prevailed. In France, in particular, following the philosopher René Descartes' way of thinking, on your left, you have what is known as Cartesianism, as from René Descartes. And his thinking was that particles exist and they're governed by laws of movement. He didn't define those laws, but he said that they exist 
and they they direct everything that we're doing, and that these laws could be expressed by mathematics. So far, we're pretty much in agreement here, but he refuted that there were forces that could act at a distance and actually have an effect on another particle. He also believed that the laws would be deduced from innate ideas, not from experimental deduction. Meanwhile, across the channel in England, there was this dude, Isaac Newton, who not long before this, in the 17th century, had also determined that there were laws governing the motion of the universe. But all these laws were rational. And yes, they could be expressed by mathematics. And we know that he did this. And if you want to curse someone for having invented calculus, you could curse him, but but he's not the only one. We can talk about Leibniz and others who contributed to the development of calculus as we know it. Newton also said that there are forces that act upon each other, and they can be very distant from each other. In fact, he applied this to explain the movement of planets and the moon and the earth. Was he believed totally at the time? Of course not. But he also said that we can discover through experimentation. Unlike Descartes, who thought that it would just be innate reasoning that would tell us what we need to know. But Newton was not of that opinion at all. And nor was Émilie du Châtelet. She was definitely in the camp of Newtonism. She had read, because she was fluent in English, she had actually, not only that, also in Latin, because Newton published all his books like everyone else did at the time in Latin. And I'll explain later what she did with that. But she was intrigued by his theories on light and optics. So she set up some experiments and she used a prism to diffract light. And we know what happens to white light when it goes through a prism. It is divided into the various colors depending on the wavelength of the light. Well, she found that at one end of that spectrum, the a candle would not melt nearly as well as it did at the other end of the spectrum where it was warmer. Okay, so the red end is warmer. So she observes this, but what she really found that was intuitive is that the candle wax melted even in a zone beyond the red light, the red color band. What she had done, in fact, had she had discovered infrared, that part of the spectrum. And she had predicted, based on her observations, that it existed. She did not know that it was infrared, as we call it today. It was still mysterious to her. But her experimentation led her to believe that her observations were caused by something happening in that band beyond the end of the visible spectrum. And she published this in what was a groundbreaking book that I'll show you in a moment. So um, th this paper... On, on this phenomenon was groundbreaking, and it came from a woman, Émilie de Châtelet. This is where I, I introduce a French poet that you're probably familiar with, Voltaire. Voltaire had a very tumultuous life. Uh, Voltaire was not in the good graces of the court in France. His political views of the monarchy were not welcome. He fled France. He went to England for an amount of time. And there he witnessed the British monarchy. And he decided to, after several years, that he would go back to France. So time had passed and perhaps some wounds had healed. He went back to Paris and silly him, he started writing about the French monarchy again and he compared it to the English monarchy, and he thought the English were doing it right and the French were not. Well, the king didn't like that, so he had to flee Paris again. But this time, he hooked up with Du Châtelet, so he knew the Marquis. He goes to the chateau where the Du Châtelet live, 
and he comes to for a spell and he ends up spending 15 years there. Because he was there and because Emily was involved in all these experiments, he got interested in what she was doing. No, he was not a born scientist. He was truly more a poet and political activist, but he got intrigued by what she was doing and they worked together. They partnered on many of her experiments. So together they did these experiments, they published, and in 1738, Walter and Du Châtelet popularized Newton's theories in the book that in English would be called Elements of Newton's Philosophy. But it was Walter's name that appeared on the book. It wasn't hers. It was his name because he was well known and he could potentially disseminate the information because his name was on the book better than she could. And her name was did not appear there. But in 1740, you can see the cover on the left of Institution de Physique, which stands for Fundamentals of Physics. Her name did appear inside this, this book. And she did two things here. She combined physics and metaphysics into this treatise. And she also discussed both the... The, the, the way of thinking that Descartes had proposed and the way that Newton had proposed. So she was impartial here, even though she personally leaned towards Newton's way of doing things, clearly. And this book had tremendous influence on other scientific thinkers that followed. So she did have this tremendous influence. And again, her name is not a household name. During her lifetime, because she was so enamored with Newton's work, she started to translate Newton's book, Principia, which was written in Latin. And that was her life goal, her life ambition to complete that. Unfortunately, she came to her demise before she had finished it. But Walter did finish it for her. And it was eventually published in 1759, about a dozen, actually more than that, I think it was 17 years after she died, but it did get published. So her wish did come true. At age 42, she became pregnant. And you may want to know, how could that happen? Well, let me tell you a little bit about society in, in France in the, be the beginning of the 18th century. It was very common then for men to have mistresses and for married women to have lovers. And in her case, she had two of them. So Walter and Du Châtelet worked together for 15 years, and they had some sort of romantic entanglement as well. Now, the Marquis, of course, was there. He lived in the Chateau with his wife and Walter all those years. And then there came a time where there was um, another lover that came along. And all this was known by the Marquis. And this is how she got pregnant at age 42. This is the beginning of the 18th century. And she had a premonition that this is, was not going to end well. She believed that she would probably die either during her pregnancy or while giving birth and because of her age, her advanced age. So uh, it, she then began this race with herself to finish the translation of Newton's book, because that is what she wanted to do. That would be her, bigger, her biggest accomplishment. Well, the day came when she gave birth to a baby girl, and things did not go so well. Um, Emily suffered from a blood clot, and it resulted in a pulmonary embolism, and a couple of days after giving birth to her daughter, she died. So her omen came true, and so did her daughter. She died as well, as an infant. So this was the, the end of Emily du Châtelet's life and career at age 42. But uh, she has been immortalized on this French stamp, 
that was published several years ago. And uh, it shows a, a young Emily, and she has uh, um, she's doing geometry. Uh, if you look at her right hand, she's holding that compass there. So that's it for Emilie du Châtelet. She was also immortalized in a Google Doodle. And again, uh, we see her uh, with a, um, a globe, and I think that could be a reference to the, uh, the work that Newton did as he looked at the Earth and other planets around us and the interactions between them. And you can see all the instruments on the far right of that picture and in her hand, leading us to believe that she does delve into mathematics extensively because that was her passion. So this was issued uh, or released in December of 21 and that uh, commemorated her 315th birthday. This woman we, we think is no mystery to us. Marie Sklodowska Curie, definitely an icon. And as we now know, She's the first name to pop up when you ask someone, can you name a woman scientist? <clears throat> she may be the only one. When she was born, Poland didn't really exist. She was born in Warsaw in 1867. But in 1772, a treaty was signed and the land mass that we know as Poland no longer existed as Poland. The Russians, the Prussians, and the Austrians divided it up. It was partitioned. And she lived in the Russian partition. Warsaw was part of the Russian Empire at the time. And that's important because the Russians would have a lot of influence on what happened in education, even back then in the 19th century. She was the fifth child of a couple, na a couple named Ranislava and um, Vlasla um, Sudowska. They were both teachers. He taught physics and mathematics. She was the owner and operator of a very prestigious school, a boarding school for girls. And she was very well respected for doing this at the time. The photograph on the left shows her father and Maria is the one in the middle and she has two of her other sisters there. There's also a brother and another sister who is uh, not in the, who they're not in the picture, but they were uh, also part of that family. The, uh, the mother was a Catholic. The father pictured here in the photograph was an atheist. I don't, I'm not quite sure how Maria felt growing up in this divided family, if in fact she was leaning towards Catholicism, but I believe that's my understanding, until, until her eldest sister, Sophia, died of typhus. And shortly after that, her mother died. And at that moment, she gave up. She had no longer had faith in faith. And she declared herself agnostic. And that's the way that she lived her life going on beyond this point. They had very, or she had very modest beginnings because her, her father had been um, in some way demoted because, again, I mentioned the Russians. So the, the schools had been closed. They had some land that was devalued. He was a, a I'll, I'll use the contemporary term, a political activist, and the authorities were not keen on these people. So he was shunned to some extent, and the family lost a lot of their fortune. And it was difficult to make ends meet. So Maria had a very humble beginning. She had to work. She had to work as a governess. And because she was a bright girl, she was able to tutor and made money that way. Her older sister, uh, who also had the same name as her, her, her mother, uh, Bronislava, uh, she was also bright, she was older, and she was going to go study in Paris. She asked Maria to come with her, but Maria did not have the means 
to pay the tuition and to live in Paris at the time. So she continued working while her sister went to Paris to study. That will have some bearing on what happens to her later on. In Warsaw, because women were not allowed in universities, a lot of bright men and women got together and they formed a clandestine university. It was often called the floating university, probably because they had to meet in different secretive places at different times. So uh, she studied with these people. They were somewhat self-taught, and I'm sure that they could teach each other some things, but it was not a formal university at all. Um, in 1890, uh, this man that's portrayed here in this image, Josef Boguski, he was a chemist who was working in the lab at the Museum of Industry and Agriculture in Warsaw. And his claim to fame, perhaps, is that he had studied under Dmitry Mendeleev, the author of the period periodic table as we know it today. So he was well-versed in chemistry, and he saw talent in her and invited her to work in his lab, which she did, until her sister in Paris invited her to join her to go live with her. And by then, Maria had earned enough money that she felt that she could do this. So indeed, she goes to Paris and she enrolls in La Sorbonne, the University of Paris. And she studies mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And she gets not one, but two degrees from the University of Paris, one in mathematics and one in physics. So she is indeed a bright girl and probably in a I don't know how hostile the environment was at La Sorbonne in the, at the end of the 19th century, but still, probably not too many women were enrolled at the time. She got a job with Gabriel Lippmann, a Frenchman, a French chemist, who became a laureate of the Nobel Prize for his work in physics in 1908, and he, he worked specifically with optics and photochemistry. He was the first one to come up with the idea and to develop color emulsions for photography. Gabriel Lippmann, again, not a name that we know commonly, but certainly a big name in his area, and he did, well, he did win the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1908. So, um, she worked for him in his lab, and she met somehow a Frenchman named Pierre Curie. And he was a teacher at a school of higher learning in, in Paris. It was the, the city school, the city school for industrial physics and chemistry. We're talking about late 1890s now. And um, Pierre Curie and, and Maria. Skoldova realized that they had common interests, and that included magnetism. And they worked on this together, and she worked in the lab, and she had access to a variety of metals, and she investigated the magnetic properties of these various steels that she had to deal with. So they worked together, and they established a good relationship. At some point the following year, Maria, who in France was known as Marie, the French equivalent, decided that she would go back to Poland to study. And she applied at the University of Krakow. And she was flatly denied because they didn't accept women at the University of Krakow. They still did not do that. So she stayed in Paris. And maybe it's a good thing that she did for two reasons. One is that she and Pierre Curie got married and they were able to work together. Admittedly, in some very shoddy circumstances. The, she was not given a state-of-the-art laboratory. Uh, they worked in some dilapidated areas. Uh, there, the, um, the conditions, the working conditions were not very good at all. And we imagine that because it's Marie Curie that uh, at the beginning of her career, she would have had all this prestigious equipment and she would have had assistance. And no, none of that. That did not happen. It was essentially her and Pierre. The name Henri Becquerel may mean something to you. Uh, he essentially 
observed rays that were coming from uranium salts. And he knew these were not X-rays that a German named Röntgen only a few years earlier had identified. They were well-defined. These rays that he was observing were not that. They were something else. So he determined or he, he demonstrated that these rays could come spontaneously from uranium. Uranium had been known for some time already as, as a, an entity. But what this, what this suggested very strongly is that the atom was not indivisible as people thought. There was something coming out of these atoms. So there was more to explore here. And Marie learned of this, and she wondered if this could be something that she could investigate. She got intrigued by this. Interestingly enough, Pierre Curie and his brother, 15 years earlier, had developed this device on the left. They called it an electrometer. And this electrometer was a device that could measure the electric charge in the surroundings. So they thought that they could use this device to measure the electric charge that was, that was uh, developed by these rays emanating from these mineral salts. And that's what they did. And they took measurements and she declared that the, char the charge was proportional to the amount of uranium that was present in the salts. And during this investigation, they looked at a variety of minerals. This became of interest to a lot of people. She looked at a mineral that is often called pitch blend. It's uraninite. It's a great source of uranium. And a German chemist at the end of the 18th century had discovered uranium. That was Martin Klaproth. He is the one who determined that uranium was a, a distinct element. And so now we're talking about that happened a century or more before Marie and Pierre looked into this. And it was known that the black portion of this, this rock here, this mineral, that is the black uraninite. And it, it is chiefly uranium oxide. Well, uranium oxide can oxidize further and this yellowish substance here, called gummite, is actually an oxidation product, and it's chiefly uranium hydroxide. Now, keep in mind, this is a very simplistic explanation, because as you will see on the next slide, minerals are, the crystals in minerals are not that simple. They're, they can be very complex. Um, hmm. uh, this particular rock, this pitch blend, um, is exactly what they were using the Curies. They got samples from Czechoslovakia and they analyzed them. And that's where they first identified the existence of polonium and radium, which I'll get to in a moment. So this is highly re radioactive. And it turns out that it's an important source of uranium for the nuclear industry. And also because it contains radium, it's also a source for the medical field as well. Now, keep in mind, there are only small amounts in each piece of rock, and I'll get to that in a moment. So the other rock that they studied was something called torbernite. And I put a chemical formula here, and this is more indicative of what you will find in many of these crystalline uh, substances. So it contains uranium, uranium oxide here, but it also contains copper and phosphate, and it's hydrated. So there is this complexity involved in separating the, the actual components of uh, the, the, uh, the chemicals that are in these rocks. And according to the United States Geological Survey, this is only somewhat radioactive. It's a very low level of radioactivity. And today, it's more of a collector's mineral than any source of uranium. But this is what the Curies worked with. Now, um, at the time, when they were doing this research, the Curies were trying to find minerals, sources of minerals to do their work, to their investigation. And industry, 
was very interested in providing samples of rocks so that they could analyze them, dissect them, because they were interested in finding the, the true sources that would bring them profit. The same thing happened with the Austrian government, an unlikely contributor, but the Austrian government provided the Curies with a lot of material because they thought that they could strike it rich as well if they found out that they had um, these veins of minerals that could be pro uh, generating profits as well. So as the Curies were working with these minerals, uh, they, they found that using the electrometer and other techniques, they found that some of these rocks were giving off much more activity than the uranium would because they had worked with uranium and they had a fingerprint of sorts, a baseline. So they asked themselves, what else is in here that could be emanating radiation like this? So what they surmised is that um, the well, two things. One is that the, the emission of rays, and if we talk about uranium, it's an intrinsic property of the uranium to emit these rays. That was not thought of beforehand because atoms were not thought to be divisible in this way. They, they weren't supposed to be uh, releasing any kind of, of material like this. And they also figured there's got to be something else in here that we don't know about that could account for our observations. They had learned from other scientists about an element called thorium. It also gave off these or some rays that could be measured. And it was Marie Curie herself who coined the term radioactivity. No one had used that before. And it came from the Latin word for a ray, radius. So she called it radioactivity. And um, she wrote about this extensively. The problem was that the Academy of Sciences in France did not want to hear it from her. Lippmann, the, 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 the person she worked for, is the one who had to deliver her paper to the elite members of the Academy of Sciences. It wasn't Marie Curie at all. Now, there was a, a precedent that had been set. Um, Patents were a big thing at the time, and publishing was important, and it was good to be first. And Marie Curie knew from experience that one of her colleagues had been involved in a race for publication, and that because he had not gotten to the publisher soon enough, he was actually uh, eclipsed from contributing his knowledge because somebody else working in the same field at the same time published before he did. So Marie wanted to avoid this. And she this paper that was presented on her behalf by Lippmann had a number of claims in it. And it turns out that one of them, she couldn't claim for herself because two months earlier in Berlin, a German chemist by the name of Schmidt had already published a paper on the activity of thorium. Again, news didn't travel that fast in those days, but so this is another example of where it is good to be first and it was difficult to, to do so at the time. They had a sample of that first rock I showed you, a pitch blend, that black rock, and they had a hundred grams of it. They pulverized it and they subjected it to a number of chemical treatments. The idea was to extract the uranium or anything else that was present in there. So I mentioned that they had minerals donated by a variety of people, and they, they used very tedious chemical uh, separations, and I'll show you in a moment a simplified version of it. And they did this, and they, they would separate the fractions, treating one with acid, and they would solubilize some materials. They would pour that away. They'd be left with a sludge, and they would treat that and separate again. And they ended up with two fractions that were different in the amount of radioactivity that they were, they were actually releasing. So she figured that she had two different elements here. And she named the first one after her native land. Poland, and that's how polonium got its name. And the second one, because it was emanating rays, 
or emitting rays, she called it radia. So that how, that's how that came to be. And those two fractions, though different, were strongly radioactive. So this is 1898 now, and in a paper in July, they announced that they have discovered this new element that they have christened polonium. And later in that same year, they announced that they have discovered something they call radium. So this is quite exciting. And they did a lot of very tedious work to do that. They, in one of those fractions, they isolated radium chloride, the RACL2 that you see there they isolated 100 milligrams of it. They started out with one ton of material, a thousand kilos of minerals that they had to pulverize and had, they had to extract and they had to separate. And they ended up with only 100 milligrams of pure radium chloride. That is 10 parts per million, 0.0001%. Actually, that's one part per million, sorry one part per million. Now, the reason that they could do this with radium, but they never succeeded in isolating polonium is because of something they did not know about at the time. And this symbol here, oops, actually, it's, it's uh, that's wrong, that one half should be a subscript, but this is the half-life. It represents the half-life, and it means that after uh, 138 days, one half, 50% of the amount of polonium that you have present will have dissipated. It's no longer there. And if you go another 138 days, half of the amount remaining will have disappeared as well. So now you're down to a quarter of the amount you had originally. So while they were trying to isolate polonium, it was decaying and it wasn't there. It was there in smaller and smaller and smaller amounts. So they never succeeded in actually isolating polonium. Well, Pierre and Marie published a lot. And in the period at the turn of the 20th century, uh, they were very active. And you have to wonder, where did they find time to do work? Because they published 32 papers. Now, they were not all tomes, of course. They could be three, five, seven pages long. But they were very prolific and avid uh, publishers of their work. One very important thing that came from the work they did at the turn of the 20th is that they found that when they exposed cells that were tumor cells to radium, those cells were destroyed. The radioactivity coming from the radium actually killed those tumor cells. That was breathtaking, and it would have implications in the 20th century, of course, as we know. So, of course... The radium also affects healthy cells, but preferentially the, the disease-causing cells are destroyed. In 1900, a, an institution in Paris, l'École Normale Supérieure, so it's um, a university-level position, she was offered to teach there, and she became the first woman faculty member of that school. Again, uh, a lot of men were directing traffic in those days, and she was one of the few women who would teach. Three years later, while she was a student at University of Paris and working at the same time, La Sorbonne, University of Paris, finally awarded her a doctorate. Of course, she had many honorary doctorates later on in life, but here was one that she had earned at La Sorbonne. And uh, in England, the royal institution invited the Curies to come to London and to talk to their members and about their work. This is 1903 now, so they've been at this for five, six years, and they are well known in the field, and they both travel to London, and it turns out they don't want to hear her. They want to hear Pierre. They want her husband to talk about their work. She was actually prevented from speaking at that meeting of the Royal Institution. So that gender discrimination was pervasive then, and of course it had come from a long history of exclusion over the years. In 1903, the, the Swedes the, finally decided that they would recognize her work. And I'm quoting here from the 
the address, it is in recognition of the extraordinary services they have rendered by their joint researches on the radiation phenomena discovered by Professor Becquerel. Who is they? They was Henri Becquerel and Pierre Curie. At the beginning, the Academy had no interest in including Marie Curie into this, even though she had done much of the work. It was a committee member who advocated for her and convinced the committee to include her. And that's how she got onto uh, the list of the not only the nominees, but the person who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903. She would not have been a recipient had it not been for that committee member who advocated for her. So um, Pierre Curie, once he heard that the committee member was going to advocate for her, he got on the bandwagon and convinced the authorities to include her. So they three people, Becquerel and the two Curies, shared the prize that year. And by the way, um, many years, there are up to and only up to three people who will share a prize. That was one of the rules in the Nobel Prize. And it's important to note, as it will become obvious later, that um, you have to be alive. It is not a posthumous award. It is only given to living people. And we'll come across that later, that restriction. Um, three years later, Pierre Curie, minding his own business, was crossing a street in Paris, and he was hit by a horse-drawn vehicle, his skull was crashed, and he died on the spot. That was a bitter disappointment for her, but she did continue her work, and uh, she applied to, be at the, to become a member of the French, French Academy of Sciences, keeping in mind that seven years earlier, she had become a recipient of the Nobel Prize, and yet they did not vote for her. It was close. It was only a couple of votes short, but it was still a couple of votes short. No woman would be admitted. Oh, um, yeah, no woman would be admitted until 1962. <clears throat> the enlightened 20th century, perhaps. The Academy of Sciences recognized her work again, because by then she had discovered polonium and radium, and she had demonstrated so much more in that field that she was nominated once again to receive the Nobel Prize in recognition of her services to the advancement of chemistry by the discovery of the two elements I mentioned, by the isolation of radium, that was the important key, the key part of this statement, and the study of the nature and compounds of this remarkable element. So because of the chemical separations and treatments that they did, this Nobel Prize was in chemistry, not in physics. So she received the first one in 1903 for physics, the second one for chemistry in 1911. Now, this there was some good that came out of this because now she's better known than ever. She has a bit more clout and she has made, come to an agreement with the French government that she wants to build an institute, a research institute, specifically for radium, because it has so much power, and of course, for other reasons as well, to explore radioactivity and its benefits and learn more about it. At first, the French government said ho-hum, but eventually the French government agreed. They were going to provide her with the space and equipment and so on, and then something terrible happened. A war broke out. So um, that was put on hold, but it did not stop Marie from doing other things. So during World War I, she saw a need to help battle surgeons. And if you're familiar with World War I, it was brutal out there. So um, what she did was to stop her work, essentially, and she procured x-ray equipment and all the accoutrements, the generators to get them going, vehicles to transport them. She transformed these vehicles into mobile radiography units and had them brought up to the front where battlefield surgeons could use them to identify problems with the patients. Her group also uh, filled hollow needles with some emanation 
of radium. And this is a little bit mysterious, but they would capture this colorless gas that was radioactive, and we now know that some of it was radon, and its purpose was to release this gas to sterilize tissues before surgery or to treat a wound. But what her bigger accomplishment was, was to provide X-ray equipment, radiogra radiographic equipment to the surgeons during the war. But with these needles to sterilize infected wounds and tissues, over a million wounded soldiers were treated during that four-year period. Well, there were some good things that happened to her. Uh, for one thing, she certainly uh, overturned a lot of the ideas that were held in physics and chemistry. Because of her work and Pierre Curie's work, um, and you could argue Henri Becquerel and a few others, uh, they laid the foundation for nuclear science as we know it today. Um, X-rays, of course, Röntgen had discovered, and she applied them to radiotherapy to treat cancer. We, I talked about the effect of radium on disease cells. Uh, Ernest Rutherford uh, did experimentation uh, he was also at my alma mater, McGill University, in the late 19th century. From there, he went to England. He was from New Zealand originally. That's where he was born. And he ended up working at the Cavendish Laboratory in England. And he did a lot of, of experiments with alpha radiation. And he might not have done as much if the Curies hadn't done their work as well. If nothing else, Marie Curie, because we now know that she's the only name that pops up when you say, do you know a female scientist? She was an inspiration to a lot of girls in the 20th century. Now, she also had a daughter. She had two daughters. Um, the, the younger one was named Zoe, and the older one, Irene, also went on into a very distinguished career in science. Uh, she obtained the Nobel Prize in 1935, and she worked with aluminum, and she bombarded it with, uh, with alpha rays. That, that those are the rays that Rutherford was working with earlier. And she did her, she showed how aluminum could become radioactive. Uh, so and, and emit neutrons. So all this work in physics was of great interest. And she was also a distinguished scientist. So a mother and daughter team of sorts here. But there was the bad. And I mentioned these. She was denied higher education at the University of Krakow. She was denied access to scientific organizations, including the French Academy of Sciences. The Royal Institution did not want to hear her speak about her work. Well, let the man do it. And clearly, she had been overlooked at uh, the first opportunity to get a Nobel Prize because she was a woman. So um, all those things occurred to her. Clearly, she was a very influential person at the turn of the 20th century and in the years that followed. And to this day, we know um, a lot about her work, and she's one of the few that comes up in conversations about uh, women scientists. So she died from aplastic anemia in 1934, a, a blood disorder, and it was thought at first that it was because of all the radioactivity that she was around. And in fact, uh, you can see in this postage stamp on the right, which is based on an actual photograph uh, from the 1920s, she's holding an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, no, not actually, well, yes, it's a flask in her hand, and we suspect that there's radioactive material in there. And yes, she did walk around with flasks in her pocket, and so did Pierre Curie, and uh, she was indeed exposed to radiation throughout her life. However, um, the the current thinking is that. It wasn't the radioactivity that killed her. And to this day, the papers that she used, the notebooks that she wrote in, even the cookbooks that she owned are sealed in lead-lined containers because of the radioactivity that they, they absorbed over time. But what is believed is that all that work that she did with x-rays during World War I is what conditioned her bone marrow. And that was the, the actual cause of her demise in 1934. Also, it's known that radium, 
is really only lethal if it's ingested, not if you're exposed to it. So uh, one more reason to blame radiation from x-rays. She was interred in a cemetery near Paris with her husband, Pierre. And interestingly enough, in France, there is a, a structure name known as the Pantheon. And some illustrious French citizens have been interred there. And it took President Mitterrand of France in 1995 to decide that they should be interred together. So the remains were taken from the cemetery near Paris and brought to the Pantheon, and that's where they are today. So I'm going to leave it there for now. If there are questions or some comments, Wally will go around and invite you to offer some. Any, any comments? Any questions? We don't have a lot of time. We can go into overtime if necessary. I just finished reading the book, Women in White Coats. Yes. And that very much explains the stress that these women were under by being ostracized from the education facilities. And do you recall the author's name? I can look it up. That's okay. Tell us a little bit about the women. Do the, do the, the authors span decades or centuries? Oh. <laughs> women in white coats. Yes. If you just Google that. Sure. Oh, it starts with the early 1800s okay. and goes through about the early 1900s, but mostly in Paris, um, Scotland. Yes. It's four major women uh -huh. that they focus on. Mostly four women. And yeah. their plight was very much what we described yes. today. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Women in White Coats, available at a library near you. I'm sorry? Campbell. Olivia Campbell Olivia. is the author yeah. of Women in White Coats. Anyone else? Oh, behind you, Wally. Sorry. I'm just very interested in the stamps, and I'm curious oh. if they are here in the United States. You know, you go to the post office, you buy your stamps, and which ones you want, and those are really wonderful, oh, well, but... I don't okay. know if they're here in the U.S. Um, the United Nations decreed that 2011 was going to be the International Year of Chemistry. And many nations or their postal authorities decided to participate. The stamp that you see on the screen now is the one that Poland issued in 2011. And it was fortuitous that they would use Marie Curie or Maria Skoldowska, as she was known in her native land, because... It was the International Year of Chemistry, and exactly 100 years before, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1911. So uh, that worked out very well, that they would do that. Other countries participated. Some of them also used Marie Curie as the person on their stamp. The U.S. did not participate, and uh, some countries used other chemists or other phenomena on their stamps. Uh, I just wanted to comment, the woman who got the Nobel Prize for uh, the mRNA vaccine, there's a very interesting story about her in the New York Times a while back. I mean, she went through 20 years of trying to get laboratory space and finally, you know, started out in Hungary and went to France, I think, and then the U.S., she kept getting passed over for yes. grants. Yes. And finally, she meets her co-inventor at a making copies at a copy machine. And he said, you can work with me in my lab. And they really provided the basis for our COVID vaccine. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, you talk about working spaces. Uh, the Curies, as I mentioned, uh, they didn't have state-of-the-art equipment or space. They were... They worked in an area in a building that had been a dissecting area at one time with very poor ventilation. They went into what would what we would call a large shed to do some of their work there. So uh, forget this idea of a glamorous laboratory that didn't come until much later in her life. And as you described, this woman also didn't have the ideal working conditions. Anything else? I think you did a great job. Thank you oh. for doing that. And um, 
just one other quick comment. I, I think, you know, the discrimination goes on. I mean, it does. Even though more women are admitted to universities, there's still a tremendous pay discrepancy, even in, in medical professions, mm -hmm. which is kind of incredible to me. Yes. And and grants and all of those things. So, I mean, at least we're allowed to speak at conferences. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and I invite you to return next week for part two of this. Very good. Thank you.